So who am I? I'm uh, Matt Clay. I'm a principal software engineer for Red Hat. Um, I started working with Ansible uh, in 2015 at the recommendation of a then former colleague of mine who happened to be uh, a uh, member of the Ansible core team. Uh, I ended up uh, joining uh, Red Hat later in uh, 2016 to work on Ansible, uh, specifically on the uh, test infrastructure. Uh, so I am a uh, maintainer of most of the uh, core test infrastructure for Ansible. Uh, I'm the creator of Ansible tests, and I'm also the author of the LexD and the JUnit uh, plugins. Uh, I enjoy using Ansible to write tests. It's a big surprise there. Uh, and also, I like to use it to, to deploy uh, our test infrastructure uh, to uh, cloud providers. So, curious, uh, before I get into the background, uh, so how many of you here have contributed to Ansible? All right, good. Maybe about half the room. And how many of you are actually familiar with uh, Ansible test already? Yeah, not bad. Okay. So, what is Ansible test? Uh, Ansible test is the tool that we use to test uh, the code in the Ansible, Ansible repository. So the engine and all of the, uh, the batteries included uh, modules, uh, plugins. Uh, it was introduced in the uh, development cycle for Ansible 2.3 uh, back in 2016. And uh, primary uh, use cases we had for that, uh, for the tool, uh, was testing the engine itself and testing the modules and testing the plugins that were in the repository. Um, Although it can be used to test roles, uh, that was not one of the primary use cases. Uh, for those of you who are interested in testing roles, you might want to take a look at the uh, uh, talk that's uh, tomorrow about uh, Molecule. So why do we create Ansible test? Well, uh, the Ansible repository is a very large repository. It's a monolithic repository. Uh, we've got a lot of plugins, a lot of modules, and we wanted to be able to make uh, changes to the code and run tests selectively so that instead of having to wait hours and hours for the entire test suite to run, if somebody made a documentation change or somebody uh, modified a single module, we could run the tests that were appropriate for uh, those changes. Uh, we also want to be able to collect code coverage on our, our test runs, uh, and not just on our unit tests. We want to be able to collect code coverage on our uh, integration tests because those were written with Ansible playbooks. Uh, we also needed a way to be able to manage uh, failing tests uh, easily. Uh, we were uh, at that point in time, adding a lot of new tests to the repository to improve the co overall uh, quality of the code. And because we had so many modules, so many plugins, uh, if we would increase the standards that we wanted uh, new code to meet, the issue we had is that uh, we have a very large number of existing code that didn't meet those standards. Rather than trying to fix all of those issues before we would uh, raise the bar, so to speak, uh, we would be able to deal with that in a, in a, in a seamless way and uh, stop uh, new issues from coming in the repository with uh, new code changes. And uh, also we wanted a good framework just for uh, extending our testing in the future. So what's new with Ansible uh, 2.9? Uh, uh, for those of you who are keeping up on what's uh, being released, uh, Ansible 2.9 is a release candidate one right now. And for the first time, Ansible test has been uh, included with uh, Ansible. Uh, prior to this point, uh, if you wanted to be able to use Ansible test, uh, you had to be running from a, a source checkout for Ansible. And the big thing now with collections is Ansible test actually supports testing collections. Uh, prior to this, if you wanted to test your own code, uh, basically your only option was to copy it into the source tree for the Ansible repository itself because Ansible test was only going to be able to test things that were in our source tree. Uh, keep in mind it is a tech preview. Uh, it is new, uh, the, the support for collections is new in, in 2.9. So there will be bugs, there are. I actually found some just working in this presentation. Uh, so if you have questions, uh, ask on IRC. Uh, if you have issues, open a uh, GitHub issue. Uh, please let us know, uh, we need that feedback. Uh, so how do you actually get started with Ansible test? Well, a couple things to keep in mind before we actually run Ansible test is how you have to work with your collections. So I don't know, how many of you are already familiar with working with collections? <coughs> okay, a few hands go up. So Ansible is a bit uh, picky, if you will, about uh, where your collections are located on disk. Uh, you can't just have your collection sitting wherever you would normally maybe like to do your development. It has to be in a valid collection route. Uh, there's a default collection route available in your home directory in the .ansible uh, collections directory. Uh, 
Underneath that, you have to have an Ansible underscore collections directory. And then below that, you can have your namespace directory and the directory for your collection itself. If you don't have your collection in a, a valid collection root, Ansible isn't going to recognize it as such, and uh, neither will Ansible test. Now, some of you may be thinking, okay, great, I can just work where I normally do, and I'll use a sim link to put my collection in place. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't work really well. Uh, current working directory on, a, on POSIX systems only pays attention to the real path. So Ansible test isn't gonna recognize your, your collections if you try to use that trick to get it in place. You're actually gonna have to have it in a, a, a real path that's a collection route. Uh, Ansible is a little bit more forgiving. Uh, certain features won't work right, though, that, are, that uh, depend on the current uh, directory to, to function. And for those of you who do like using dashes in your names, sorry, uh, you have to have, use uh, valid Python identifiers for both your namespace and your, your collection name. So use an underscore instead. Uh, quick note about uh, collections and version control. Please use version control for your collections. You don't have to use Git, but it's highly recommended. Uh, Ansible test has some special support for that. Uh, when you set up your Git ignores, Ansible test will pay attention to those. So if you want to ignore files from your editor, your IDE, backup files, things like that, Ansible test will, will honor those. Uh, you'll want to ignore your uh, PyC files so that compiled Python code is not gonna show up in the tests and uh, also the tests output directory that Ansible test generates. So what do you have to actually do to get it? Well, because it's included with Ansible now, simple thing to do, pip install, make sure you're getting uh, right now 290 RC1. Uh, I recommend using Python 3, uh, 5 or greater, and uh, install in a virtual environment. It's not a requirement, but uh, it's a better place to start. Uh, also one note, for those of you who are maybe in a hurry, don't install Ansible-test with pip. That's actually an unrelated project. Uh, the correct package you want is just Ansible. Uh, and if you're using a bash for your shell, uh, arg complete is something really good to have installed. That'll give you tab completion for Ansible test. Uh, not just for Ansible test, you'll actually get uh, tab completion for all of the Ansible CLI tools as well. So what do you have to actually do to run Ansible test? Well, first thing you need to do is make sure you're actually in a collection directory. If you try to run Ansible test when you're not inside your collection, it's just gonna give you an error message if it can't find that uh, collection. Uh, if you think you're in a collection, uh, double check your path, uh, what I mentioned before about uh, your actually having a valid collection route. Uh, if you need help with any of the commands, uh, dash dash help is available for all of the Ansible test commands. Uh, most of the help is specific to individual subcommands, so if you're just trying to do Ansible test dash dash help, you're not gonna see a whole lot. Specify the extra command that you need after that, ask for help, you're gonna get a lot more information about what, uh, what's available. And Ansible test does have several different ways you can run it. Uh, what I'm gonna focus on the talk uh, today, uh, and because it's both the recommended and in most cases the easiest approach, is to use Docker. Uh, we have a dash dash Docker option for that. That's gonna cause Ansible test to run all of the tests in a uh, ephemeral Docker container, spins it up for the test run, runs all the tests. When it's finished, it's gonna tear that down for you. Uh, one note about the default Docker container that we use, it is rather large because of all the dependencies it has. Uh, we have uh, six different Python versions in there and uh, all the requirements as well as tools for even testing uh, some special cases like if you're doing um, Windows development, uh, we have uh, tools for testing uh, PowerShell code. We are working on trimming that down and that's something that's not going to happen for 2.9 unfortunately. Uh, and if you do need to use a custom container, that is an option. So you're not limited to using just what we have. So the first kind of test that is provided by Ansible test, and this is actually probably, I'd say, one of the, the best things to focus on just because you don't have to write anything yourself is our sanity tests. Uh, these are our static analysis for the most part, uh, rules, uh, tests, things that we put together for checking overall code quality, uh, finding common issues in the Ansible repository. So using this on your collection, you can leverage those same lessons learned that uh, Ansible community has and uh, benefit from that. Uh, the nice thing is there's something for you to write, there's something for you to configure. All you have to do is run the sanity tests. Uh, we do have a wide variety of tests. Uh, some of them you're gonna be familiar with. We have things like uh, PyLint, YAMLint, so on. Uh, configuration is already provided so that you don't have to put all those in your, your collection directory. Uh, and then we have a, a pretty wide variety of tests as well that are specific to Ansible, things that uh, you're not gonna see on a, on a, a normal project. 
uh, documentation for all the available sanity tests. Uh, it's available uh, on the docs website. Uh, I've got a link on the slides. Um, it does document a few sanity tests that are specific to the Ansible repository itself that don't apply to collections, but most of them are, are ones that will apply to collections. So actually running sanity tests is pretty straightforward. Uh, if you just want to run all the tests in your, the collection that you're currently in, Ansible dash test sanity, um, put on the dash dash docker option to get the delegation into a docker container, uh, dash v for a little bit of extra verbosity, uh, make things a little easier to see what's going on. Uh, if you need to list all the tests that are available, uh, dash dash list tests. That'll show everything that you have. Uh, you can use dash, te dash dash test and specify specific test or tests that you want to run. Maybe there's a certain test that you need to iterate on because it was failing on a previous run. You don't want to run the whole list of tests again. You can focus on just that particular test. Uh, likewise, you can specify particular files. You don't have to run the test over your entire collection. You can target a specific path or paths, uh, even a specific directory. Uh, so sooner or later, probably sooner, when you run your sanity tests, you're going to get errors. Now, that's not to be that's not unexpected. Uh, hopefully, you can fix them. Uh, but if not, uh, either due to time constraints, uh, usually that's, that's what it happens to be, especially the first time you're running your sanity tests, uh, is Ansible test provides a way for you to, to record uh, ignore entries, basically to acknowledge that, hey, I know this is an issue, but don't bug me about it right now. So uh, there's a file that you put those in. It's a simple flat text file. Uh, there's a, inside the test directory, there's a sanity subdirectory. You create an ignore dash x dot y uh, version file uh, specific to the Ansible version that you're running under. So if you're testing with Ansible 2.9, you're going to have a ignore dot or ignore dash 2.9 dot text. And in that, you would be able to list uh, any of the files and the error codes that you are, are going to basically suppress for, for hopefully dealing with later. Um, now, there's an interesting feature with this. It's actually quite uh, important to call out. Ansible test is very picky about what you do with your ignores. If you would ignore a test failure now, that's fine. But if you ever fix that later, which hopefully you will, and you don't remove the ignore entry, Ansible test is going to complain about that. It's actually going to say that that's an error. You're ignoring an, a, a condition that no longer exists. You might be wondering, well, why is that important? Why, why bother with that? Well, that's actually really good for, for regression detection. Because you may or may not have intentionally fixed that issue. If you leave that ignore in place, Ansible test is going to continue to ignore that error for the rest of time. If you fix that issue, though, and it complains about it, next time you run the tests, now you know, hey, I've, uh, I've, I fixed this. You can take the ignore out. Now if you regress later, now Ansible test can actually tell you about that problem. So by keeping that file clean, which Ansible test is going to help you with, you don't have to worry about having issues get fixed and then regress later without going uh, undetected. So, uh, Quick uh, layout here, uh, just like I was talking on the previous slide. So under your collection directory, you'd have uh, tests, sanity, and one or more ignore files. Uh, so you test with more Ansible, Ansible versions, you're going to end up having more ignore files uh, there. What do those some, uh, ignore entries actually look like? Well, they're pretty straightforward. You have the path to the, the file that's being uh, involved in the test, uh, space, and then the name of the test that you need to, to ignore. If that uh, test happens to have uh, a, a problem that uh, you can't actually even run the test at all, you can actually skip the test entirely with uh, putting a, a bang skip at the end of the test name. Uh, and if, there's, uh, if, you're, if it's a test like, say, PyLint, where it has multiple error codes involved, you can have a colon and the name of the specific test that you need to ignore. So your basic sanity workflow for running the tests hopefully looks something like this. You're going to run the test once. You're going to find the errors that, or fix the errors that are reported now that you can. Maybe, you, maybe there's two errors and they're easy to deal with. Maybe it's something more complicated. Maybe you've got a huge collection that you, you've brought in and you don't have time to tackle all those issues now. So you fix the ones you can, ignore the rest. Don't do it, don't do it manually. Make sure you actually put it in the ignore file so you're, you're getting a benefit from that. And then run tests again to make sure that now your ignore entries are complete, everything's passing. So you want to do this with every version of Ansible that you're supporting with your collection. So, if you're waiting for stable releases, you're going to be testing with Ansible 2.9. When 2.10 comes out, go ahead and test for 2.10. Same thing for 2.11. Uh, once versions get deprecated and no longer supported by your collection, feel free to remove those ignore files and, and stop testing for those older versions of Ansible. Uh, this is important because 
As time goes on, each new Ansible release is going to include new tests, changes to tests. The behavior is going to be different. You're going to see new tests that we have created because we found new, new things that we can report, issues that we can say, hey, this is going to be a problem maybe for a particular Ansible version, or maybe this is just something that we've automated now where it was maybe a, a, a practice we knew that people should avoid before, but now we actually have a test for it. So in your ongoing development of your collections, um, try to incorporate Ansible test into your development process. When you make changes, run the tests and fix the reported issues before you are merging in your code. Uh, don't just keep piling up issues. Uh, and that ignore list that you've maintained, try to go back and review that periodically. Work down that list. It doesn't have to be done all at once, but, but stay on top of that. The goal is to get down to the point where you don't have any tests that you have to ignore. So besides sanity tests, we have uh, integration tests. Now, this is actually where you have to actually start writing some of your own tests. And these are usually done with Ansible roles. Um, typically, you're going to be running your, your modules. You're going to be running your plugins. Uh, you're going to need to assert the results. Uh, just have additional tasks for that. And uh, register any variables that you need. Make sure everything's functioning as you intended. Uh, if you need to, you can use shell scripts. And I'll show what that layout looks like here in just a little bit. So why do you actually want an integration test? Well, because some of you may be thinking, hey, let's just go straight to unit tests. Well, the nice thing about integration tests is they're simple to read. Hopefully most of you know how to write Ansible roles. That's all an integration test is usually. You just write a role, you have your tasks, run the modules, do your asserts. So they're easy to read, easy to write, easy to maintain. And you're going to be verifying the correct behavior of, of whatever plugins, whatever modules you're working with. And because you're using tasks, you're working against basically what's a stable API for your plugins and your modules. Hopefully you're not breaking backwards compatibility as you make changes to your collection. You're maintaining the, the same argument specs or at least in a compatible argument spec for your modules and so on. So if you have to refactor all your code, you're not going to be changing those arg specs. Your tests should still pass. It's actually a really great way to make sure that when you've uh, made changes that you haven't broken anything. Uh, and the nice thing too, Ansible test with uh, integration tests, you're going to have support for code coverage, which I'm going to get, uh, get into a little bit later. So what do you have to do to write your integration tests? Well, as I mentioned before, they're just Ansible playbooks or roles. So once you've uh, written those, a uh, couple things to keep in mind, uh, make sure that you're, you're actually asserting that your, your modules and your plugins are doing what you, what you think. Don't just create a task that runs a module, go on next task, run it. Actually put some asserts in there, make sure that the return values you're getting are correct. Uh, if your module supports check mode, actually make sure that it functions in check mode, that both with and without check mode. Uh, there's quite a bit of documentation on writing integration tests in the, uh, the Ansible documentation. I've got a link on the, uh, the slides for that as well. And we don't, obviously don't have time to get in today how to go through writing roles and the details of, of uh, what those tests look like. But looking at the Ansible repository is a great way to get uh, uh, really good idea of what integration tests look like, a lot of different approaches uh, to testing, see how existing modules and plugins are tested. Uh, the layout for an integration test, uh, also under the test directory, uh, we have an integration directory under that. Uh, if you have a requirements.txt there, that will uh, be used by Ansible Test to install common requirements for all of your different test targets that you run. Uh, the targets directory, which is adjacent to that, uh, is basically your roles directory. Uh, we call it a targets directory because it doesn't have to be an Ansible role, it could be a script. Uh, so typically you're gonna name your test targets after your individual modules or your individual plugins. And underneath that, uh, there's a configuration file that Ansible test can use called an aliases file. Uh, it's not a requirement, but if you, do, if you do need to use that, that's where it's gonna be. And then your typical, your role layout uh, tasks, uh, main.yaml and you know, any other directories and, and uh, content you need for your, your test. Uh, the script-based tests are, are laid out basically the same way. The only difference is instead of having your, your Ansible role in there, you're gonna have a runme.sh. Make it executable, put a shebang on the file. You can do whatever logic you need to in there. Uh, that's particularly helpful when you're working with uh, certain plugins, uh, maybe an inventory plugin where you have to do some additional setup before you can actually run a, a playbook or a role to finish your testing. Uh, running your integration tests, just like with, with the uh, sanity tests, pretty straightforward. Uh, Ansible dash test uh, integration, and again, I recommend using the dash dash docker option. 
Uh, if you need to use your own container, uh, that option does take an argument. Uh, but uh, if you can work with the default container that we provide, that's uh, probably uh, the easiest approach to get started. Now, if you need to run a specific test, you can pass one or more uh, test target names on the command line. Uh, for tests that are focused on Windows modules, we do actually have a different command um, can run. I'm not going to get into that one today, but it's uh, Windows dash integration instead of integration. And uh, similar for uh, network appliances, uh, there's a, a separate uh, network dash integration uh, command. Uh, main difference with those is they, they have some differences in how they handle inventory and certain expectations around how the tests uh, function. So I mentioned the uh, integration test uh, configuration file, the aliases. Um, it's a pretty simple file. It's a, a flat uh, text file, one line uh, per entry. You can put comments in there with a hash character. Uh, it's placed in the individual target directories. And uh, there's a, there's a lot of good information on what kind of uh, entries can go in those files. Uh, again, on the documentation site, um, some of that documentation doesn't apply to collections. That's uh, something that uh, hopefully will get uh, improved with the docs uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, one of the key things you can use that for is uh, disabling failing tests. Uh, just like you with the uh, sanity tests and the ignorers, where you want to basically keep your test passing by acknowledging the things that uh, are failures that you're not going to address right now. Likewise, you want to do the same thing with your integration tests. You should be able to run your integration tests and have everything pass. If you have tests that are failing for some reason and you can't fix them, you can put a, a single line in your aliases file that says disabled. Uh, this will tell Ansible test that you actually want to, to disable this test and ignore it by default. Uh, if you do run the tests, you're going to get a warning saying, hey, I've skipped these two or three however many tests because they've, they've been marked as disabled. Uh, if you need to, to run them anyway to, to make sure that, hey, th this is still actually something that I want to keep disabled, is it not passing? Um, there's an option, dash dash allow disabled. Uh, we'll override that warning, and the, the warning includes a reminder about that. Again, the goal there is, is keep your test passing. Uh, so on a unit test, pretty basic. They're uh, typically done with PyTest and mock. That's what uh, we're, we're recommending. Uh, but why do you want to do it? Well, unit tests are great when you can't get the job done with integration tests. Um, error conditions in particular can be hard to reproduce with playbooks, uh, particularly things involving timing or specific conditions that are uh, difficult to reproduce on a system. So uh, mocking with, uh, with mock and uh, testing those uh, scenarios with unit tests uh, is a much better way to accomplish that than trying to uh, maybe just give up and say, well, I can't test with an integration test. I'm not going to test this case. Well, okay, you can do that with a, with a unit test. Um, it's also easier to test complex logic. There are certain things, especially if your logic and your, your modules and your plugins is, is factored out, uh, you can test that pretty effectively with uh, unit tests. might be kind of difficult with integration tests. And I'm sure some of you are already thinking, it's like, well, hey, I could just use PyTest. I can use mock directly. Why do I need to use Ansible test? What's, what's the point? So there are a few things that Ansible test does to make testing your, your collections with unit tests uh, easier than just using uh, PyTest directly. Uh, first thing is, is we have support for the Ansible collection loader. Um, I'm guessing most of you aren't familiar with what that does, but one of the, one of the key uh, differences between Python 2 and Python 3 is that we have implicit namespace support under Python 3. You don't have to have an init.py in every directory to turn a uh, directory structure into namespaces. On Python 2, you do. So we don't require an init.py in every directory for your plugins, your modules, uh, in a collection. And the reason why we can do that is because Ansible has a collection loader which unifies that behavior between Python 2 and Python 3. To get that same behavior when you're running your unit tests, you need to have that collection loader available. Ansible test provides that for you. Uh, another really handy thing to have, especially for those of you who don't like to repeat yourselves, if you're using Ansible test, you can use relative imports in your unit tests. So instead of having to specify your imports, it's like say you want to test a module. Instead of having to have from Ansible underscore collections dot whatever your namespace is dot collection name dot plugins dot modules import my module, you can have five dots plugins dot modules import. Now you don't have to have your namespace. You don't have to have your collection uh, hard coded into your unit tests. Uh, if you don't have, if you're not using Ansible test, those relative imports will not work. PyTest won't be able to figure out where, where you're relative to. It's going to tell you, hey, I'm not in a package. Can't do this. And uh, continuing, just like we have with sanity tests and with integration tests, we've got code coverage support. Yes, you can get that with PyTest Cov. No, you can't get it with as many different Python versions as we have with Ansible test. 
So writing your unit tests, as I mentioned, basic tools, standard, uh, standard Python tools for testing, PyTest, PyTest mock and mock. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, there are, I've got links on the slides for those. Uh, again, we do have documentation on how to write uh, unit tests, also on the slides. And again, if you need examples for how to test different scenarios, how to solve different problems, great thing to do is go look at the unit tests that are already in the Ansible repository and see what's there. So your unit with test layout, you have some flexibility, but at the same time, if you follow a certain uh, layout that Ansible test is expecting, things are going to work better. Uh, again, under the tests directory in your collection, you can have a requirements.txt. If you have this, when you run your, your uh, unit test with Ansible test, particularly in a container, Ansible test is going to know to install those requirements before running your tests. It's really handy because if you, if you do have special requirements and you're using our default container, they're not already going to be there. You need to have some way to get those into the container. Uh, put, uh, put your unit tests in the unit directory and then follow the same directory structure as the code under test. So if you're testing a module, that's going to be under plugins, modules, and then it's going to be the file's going to be named after your module, but you need to make sure and prefix that with test underscore. It's typical uh, PyTest behavior and Ansible test uh, requires that as well. So again, running tests, pretty straightforward. Ansible test, units, and again, I recommend using dash dash docker. Uh, if you do need to run a test for a specific file, you can specify the path to the test or the tests. And uh, again, directories work as well. Uh, if you do specify a directory, make sure you include a trailing slash on the end of the path. So the Ansible test knows that it's a directory you're, you're trying to, to uh, work with. Uh, and as long as you're following the naming convention that Ansible test expects for, your mo for the placement of your unit tests, there's actually a shorthand you can use. You can just say Ansible-test units in the name of your module, and Ansible test will find the correct unit test for that module. Really handy if you uh, don't like typing and maybe you don't have tab completion installed. So I do have a few tips for those of you who are uh, intent on, on writing unit tests. Uh, try to mock the public interfaces of things that you're working with. Um, the public interfaces are generally more stable. And that's a good thing for the, the long-term support and viability of your, your unit tests. If you can, mock your dependencies rather than importing them, because then what you tend to do is you end up uh, mocking the internal behaviors of those dependencies. Uh, maybe a little more work up front, but in the long term, it, it can yield uh, tests that are much more focused on your code and are, are less brittle, uh, particularly because you may have uh, a dependency that uh, you have to mock uh, HTTP requests or some other internal behavior, and then the developer decides to change something. They come out with a new release, and oh, look, tomorrow your tests are no longer working, and you have to rewrite half your unit tests because you're mocking all the internals of some dependencies. Um, <clears throat> but they can also get in the way of your own refactoring. If you have to mock a lot of the internals of uh, your own code, uh, those aren't generally stable interfaces on the internals. Somebody wants to go refactor something, whether it's a new feature or fixing bugs, you may find that you have to rewrite a lot of your unit tests just because you've been mocking internal behavior instead of limiting yourself to the, the uh, public and hopefully stable interfaces in your code. Uh, and following the theme for keeping your tests passing, if you do have unit tests that aren't passing, please use the X fail marker to mark that with PyTest. That way when you run your unit tests, the ones that you know are not working, those can fail and it doesn't impact the results. You can come back later and try to fix those. But the goal is to be able to run those tests and not have to look through the list and say, well, okay, I know this one's okay to be ignored because, yeah, we, I think this one's not supposed to be passing or go ask a colleague, well, is this one correct? So take advantage of that X fail marker, makes things a lot easier. So one of my favorites, code coverage. How many of you uh, know what code coverage is? Good, actually, at least half the room. So how many of you are actually using code coverage when you run your tests? Not so many. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, code coverage is gonna give you analysis of executed lines of code, and uh, both Python and, so thanks to a uh, feature that uh, was recently added for Ansible 2.9, uh, PowerShell modules. Uh, for Python code, we can get uh, both branch coverage and line coverage. PowerShell is currently limited to uh, line coverage. The difference there is that if you're looking at uh, code coverage for individual lines, all you're gonna get is a hit or no hit for this line of code get executed. You get branch coverage, you have a conditional, you have a for loop, something that uh, ha has conditions to it, it'll get indication of partial coverage. 
uh, or full coverage. Uh, it's a simple Boolean expression. If you only test it when it's true, well, that's going to be partial coverage. If you test it when it's true and when it's false, that's going to give you full coverage. So when you use code coverage, you get have your uh, re results reported in a few different ways. Um, you can get a nice simple summary to the console, just going to give you a list of all your files, lines hit, branches hit, give you an overall percentage of how much of your code's uh, been covered. You can get a, a human readable HTML report. Gives you basically the same information, but you can actually drill down all the way from uh, the directories down to individual files. And you can actually view on a line by line basis, go through, look at your code, see which functions, see which lines are hit, which ones aren't. And uh, if you do need a machine readable output, you can also get XML output. Um, this is a Cobertura format. It's uh, particularly useful if you're working with any systems, uh, any tools any uh, third-party services that uh, take uh, code coverage data in and visualize it perhaps better than, say, the built-in tools that uh, are uh, available. A um, couple that come to mind, uh, Coveralls IO and CodeCov IO, both uh, provide services for that. It's uh, something that's actually really handy for hooking up to your uh, CI system, uh, which we'll get to a little bit later, uh, for just being able to visualize your, your code coverage when you make changes to your code. So. Why do you want to use code coverage? It's great to have the data, but what's good for? Well, main thing is, is you can identify gaps in your testing. Just because you think you're testing all of your code or you think you're testing the important parts doesn't mean you actually are. So it can be often very surprising to find out when you actually go look at code coverage reports that, oh, I thought I was testing this block of code. I thought I was testing this branch. I thought I was getting much better coverage on this module than I am. Don't guess, you actually want to know. That's what the code coverage is for. Not only that, uh, it just it's, it can be good for identifying just pieces of dead code. Maybe you find out it's like, well, I'm trying to hit this code. I can't I can't get my test to hit this code. Oh well, you know what? You can't actually reach this code. It's not even used. Okay, well we can take this out. So when you use the code coverage, as I mentioned before, you can view the statistics overall at the entire collection level. You can actually get all the way down to the individual files and the individual directories. So you can look at it at whatever level you need to to make the decisions that you're trying to make. Whether you're trying to evaluate how thorough your test coverage is or maybe just uh, gauge uh, your confidence in, have we broken something with tests? If you've only got 10% code coverage and you run your test suite, maybe you're not so confident that you've actually found all the problems that might be lurking there. If you've got 90% coverage, it's a better indication. It's not a guarantee, but it's a much better indication that you're actually being fairly thorough when you're testing. So what do you have to do to run with code coverage? Ansible test makes it pretty simple. You get to use the same commands that you've already used before, whether it's sanity, integration, or units. There's a real basic workflow. Ansible-test, coverage, erase. That's gonna clear out any existing coverage data that's already been collected, maybe from, from previous runs that you've already done. And then you're gonna run your test as needed, whether it's a single unit test run or integration test run, or maybe it's five or six or 10 or however many different runs that you need to do to run all the different tests that you want to uh, combine together for your analysis. All you have to do is tack on the dash dash coverage option to the end of that, any of those commands, that will enable code coverage. Then when you're done, ask for your reports. There's three different ways to get them for those three different types of output. You can do ansible dash test coverage report. It's gonna give you your basic console output. Uh, the HTML uh, version, of course, for generating an HTML report and the ansible dash test coverage XML if you want that, that machine readable version. So, continuous integration. I hope all of you are using continuous integration. Yes, no? Only a few hands? Okay, okay, I can see a little bit better. <laughs> so, hopefully you all even know what continuous integration is. Yes. Yes, okay, a little bit better. So, key thing there, test before you merge. Some people have this idea that you, you run the test, you can ignore the results, go ahead and merge anyway. Please don't do that. You have Ansible test, use it, whether it's just for the sanity tests, whether it's sanity and integration and unit tests, but run the tests, actually gate your changes on the results. If your tests aren't passing, fix those issues. If you can't fix them, take advantage of the ignorers, take advantage of the disabled alias, take advantage of the X fail marker, and then try to keep track of those things. Don't just forget about them. If you need to use an issue tracker, do that. If you need to uh, go check the, your ignore list periodically, go do that. But stay on top of those. Don't just let your tests drop. Uh, I highly recommend that you also look at daily runs for your tests. 
if not maybe at least weekly. Uh, really good reason for that. Most of you are not working completely in your own little sandbox. You're going to have dependencies on things outside of your own code base. You're going to have uh, external dependencies for uh, some of your requirements. You may be working with third-party services. You may be needing to use containers or other resources that are not part of your, your source control, not part of your own infrastructure, which means they can change out from underneath you. So if you're not running your tests on a regular basis, you can have things like waking up Monday morning and going to make a change and, hey, my tests aren't passing. Did I just break something? Well, no, actually, you didn't break something. Last Friday, somebody released a new version of one of your dependencies and that broke your tests. So if you're running your changes every day and looking at those test results, you'd find out that's this much earlier. Uh, saves you a lot of trouble, uh, particularly if you don't have uh, a lot of activity on your uh, code base because you may find that, oh, I need to go fix this critical bug and I haven't touched the repository in uh, three weeks. Well, two weeks ago it broke. Now I have to deal with this issue that was not so pressing back then, but now it is because I have to get something out the door. And uh, if you aren't using code coverage on your regular test runs, uh, perhaps because of the additional overhead, one thing I do recommend, do it on your nightly runs. Look at the results there, if nothing else. Uh, so. There's not a whole lot that's real special about using Ansible tests with continuous integration, but there are uh, a few things you have to keep in mind. As I mentioned before, your collections do have to be in that correct collection path. So most CI systems are not going to drop your code in the correct location. It's just going to put it in some folder. So if you happen to be using something like, say, GitHub Actions, where you can specify the correct path to check out to, you can go ahead and do that. Otherwise, you're going to need to have, tell your CI system either copy or move the files into the correct directory structure so the Ansible test can work with them. Uh, also, make sure you're actually testing with the Ansible versions that you intend to support with your collections. Right now, it's going to be pretty straightforward. If you're not on the bleeding edge, if you're just working with what's released, you'll just test against Ansible 2.9. Once 2.10 comes out, add that to your test matrix, add that to your, your CI configuration so that you can be testing for both of those versions. And for your integration tests, you may not be able to run them for every version of Python, but I at least recommend that you run them on 2.7 and the latest 3x release. Uh, main reason there is that there are significant differences between Python 2, Python 3, best way to find those is through testing, and yes, despite Python uh, 2.7 uh, reaching end of life uh, the uh, start of next year, there are distributions, including ones like Red Hat Enterprise Linux, that are going to be supporting it for the foreseeable future. You're likely to have users that are still using those versions, so don't forget about those Python 2.7 users. And uh, throw in the dash uh, V option when you're running under CI. It'll make your job a little bit easier when you need to, to troubleshoot things because you get a more verbosity there. Um, there are a few other options that are uh, handy to use when you're working with CI that maybe you, you wouldn't have uh, been using for local testing. It's the dash dash color option to force output uh, uh, on the, the uh, CI systems to be in color. Most CI systems are going to get auto-detected as not supporting color. You're going to get just plain monochrome output. It's not as easy to read, so throw that option on there. It's going to make things a bit easier to, to, to follow. That carries through both not only to uh, the coloring of the output for Ansible tests, but it will actually force the color output on Ansible as well. Uh, some CI systems don't report their uh, console width very well, and even if they do, you don't necessarily want to tr um, have the uh, truncation occurring on the uh, commands displayed that Ansible test normally does, so throw uh, dash dash truncate zero on there, and that will uh, shut that truncation off so that you get the full command output. Another one that's really handy is uh, retry on error. So what this will do for you is if the tests do fail, Ansible tests will run them one more time and it's going to max out the verbosity. Uh, solves basically two scenarios here. One, if it's a transient failure, it's a good chance the test will pass on the second try. This will help let you know that without having to actually go run it again. It's like, well, it failed the first time, passed the second time. Okay, maybe I need to go look at this and figure out you know, what, what's going on. Uh, it'll still get reported as, as a uh, pass if it passes on the second time, but uh, there is uh, uh, another interaction with that I'll mention in just a moment here. Uh, the second thing is just the fact that you get that increased verbosity. It can be very frustrating to go look at your CI system and say, hey, it failed, now I gotta go run this in myself because I didn't have enough output. So when it gets rerun that second time with max verbosity, that makes it a lot easier to hopefully troubleshoot, figure out where your problem is. Maybe you don't even have to go run it locally to, to figure that out. Uh, Again, dash dash docker option. This will make your, your uh, test results a lot more reproducible, particularly not just between your CI runs, but then when somebody wants to go run that same test locally. 
to make, make things a lot, uh, lot simpler. If your CI system does support JUnit output, I recommend using the dash dash JUnit option. It's only needed for integration tests. The other test types already generate the output by default. But this will actually turn on the JUnit uh, callback plugin within Ansible. You'll get all your, your tasks reported as uh, JUnit output. It can uh, make uh, viewing of your, your test results, uh, particularly your failures, uh, a lot easier. Again, it's somewhat dependent on how your CI system uh, or whatever tools you're using uh, present uh, that information. So wrapping things up, a few key things to remember. Please, always use the sanity tests. If you don't have time to write your own tests, at least run the sanity tests. Write your, unit te or write your integration tests before you, you resort to unit tests. Your integration tests are going to be a lot easier to maintain. Um, if there are things you can't hit with your integration tests, fall back to writing unit tests. Please check your code coverage. Don't just guess, but make sure you're actually testing what you think you're testing. Use continuous integration. And uh, finally, uh, feedback is appreciated. Remember, Ansible test, particularly the collection support, is still in tech preview. So there will be things that will be maybe inconvenient, things we haven't thought, thought of. Please let us know. If you have bugs, file those so we can get things fixed. Uh, looks like we might have a minute or two for questions. Anybody have questions? All right. Well, thank you, everybody.